Many modern defenders of baptism of desire will quote St. Thomas Aquinas to support their position. The Summa Theologica, Question 68, Article 3, Part 3, Question, Whether Baptism Should Be Deferred, I answer that. In this matter we should make a distinction and see whether those who are to be baptized are children or adults. For if they be children, baptism should not be deferred. First, because in them we do not look for a better instruction or fuller conversion. Secondly, because of the danger of death, for no other remedy is available for them besides the sacrament of baptism. On the other hand, adults have a remedy in the mere desire for baptism. St. Thomas Aquinas only believed that a catechumen, who knew what baptism was, and actually desired to be baptized, could get a quote, baptism of desire. Modern defenders of baptism of desire reject this. They believe a pagan, who has never even heard of baptism, can get a baptism of desire. They also believe that a Jew, who is aware of what baptism is, and does not even desire a baptism, can get a baptism of desire. Unlike St. Thomas Aquinas, the modern defenders of baptism of desire believe that people can be saved in any false religion whatsoever. Even though St. Thomas Aquinas does not hold their position, they quote him anyway. Most of them even go so far as to condemn those who correctly reject baptism of desire as heretical. Many of them seem to think that just because St. Thomas Aquinas believed in baptism of desire, that St. Thomas Aquinas would then necessarily condemn those who did not believe in baptism of desire. This is not true. Just because St. Thomas Aquinas held a certain theological position, that does not necessarily mean that he thought any position that differed from his was heretical or even erroneous. Sometimes St. Thomas would just politely disagree. To prove this, I'd like to direct you to the Summa Theologica. The Summa Theologica, Question 61, Article 3, Part 1. Question whether the angels were created before the corporal world. Now let's look how St. Thomas Aquinas answers this question. St. Thomas answers, on the contrary, it is said, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Now this would not be true if anything had been created previously. Consequently, the angels were not created before the corporal nature. St. Thomas Aquinas makes it very clear that he does not believe that the angels were created before the corporal world. But let's see what happens when St. Gregory the Nazianzen is brought up in one of the objections. Objection 1. It would seem that the angels were created before the corporal world. For Jerome says, 6,000 years of our time had not yet elapsed. Yet how shall we measure the time? How shall we count the ages in which the angels, thrones, dominations, and other orders served God? Damascene also says, some say the angels were begotten before all creation, as Gregory the theologian declares. He first of all devised the angelic and heavenly powers, and the dividing was the making thereof. Now let's look at how St. Thomas Aquinas treats his own opinion in light of the fact that Gregory the theologian disagrees with him. Consequently, it is improbable that God, whose works are perfect, as it is said in Deuteronomy 32.4, should have created the angelic creature before other creatures. At the same time, the contrary is not to be deemed erroneous, especially on account of the opinion of Gregory Nazianzen, whose authority in Christian doctrine is of such weight that no one has ever raised objection to his teaching, as is also the case with the doctrine of Athanasius, as Jerome says. St. Thomas Aquinas, even though we disagreed with the opinion of St. Gregory the Nazianzen, would not dare condemn his position, or even call it erroneous. Now what does this have to do with baptism of desire? This pertains to baptism of desire, because Gregory the Nazianzen, whose opinion St. Thomas would not dare object to, or even call erroneous, rejected baptism of desire. Here is a clip from Brother Peter Diamond's video, St. Gregory the Nazianzen rejected baptism of desire. This is Brother Peter Diamond, VaticanCatholic.com. I wanted to talk about St. Gregory Nazianzen and his views on baptism, quote, baptism of desire, and infant baptism. As we quoted in our salvation book, St. Gregory Nazianzen, father and doctor of the church of the fourth century, 
clearly and repeatedly rejected the concept of, quote, baptism of desire. I wanted to quickly discuss what he said on that matter before covering what he said on infant baptism and its relevance to this issue. In point number 22 of his oration on holy baptism, dated January 6, 381, St. Gregory says, quote, But then you say, Is not God merciful? And since he knows our thoughts and searches out our desires, will he not take the desire of baptism instead of baptism? You are speaking in riddles if what you mean is that because of God's mercy, the unenlightened is enlightened in his sight, and he is within the kingdom of heaven who merely desires to attain it. End quote. As we can hear, St. Gregory could hardly have been more clear in rejecting the concept of baptism of desire. And what's remarkable about this quote is that about half of the defenders of baptism of desire, who would write articles in defense of baptism of desire, would argue that St. Gregory Nazianzen did not reject baptism of desire. That's how extraordinarily dishonest they are. And if that quote were not sufficient to prove the point that he clearly and repeatedly rejected baptism of desire, let's consider what he says in point 23, quote, If you judge the murderously disposed man by his will alone, apart from the act of murder, then you may reckon as baptized him who desired baptism, apart from the reception of baptism. But if you cannot do the one, how can you do the other? I cannot see it. Or if you like, we will put it thus, if desire in your opinion has equal power with actual baptism, then judge in the same way in regard to glory, and you may be content with longing for it as if that were itself glory. And what harm is done by your not attaining the actual glory as long as you have the desire for it? End quote. So, St. Gregory Nazians and Doctor of the Church clearly rejected the concept that the desire for baptism could place the unenlightened in the camp of the enlightened, or the unjustified in the camp of the justified, or the man outside the kingdom, that is, outside the church, inside the church. And in point 23, one of the points we were just quoting from, St. Gregory also says that infants who depart without baptism, unsealed as he calls it, as well as individuals who want baptism but depart without receiving it, will not be glorified. And I should quote what he said to further nail down this point. Speaking of this category of individuals, he says, Others are not in a position to receive it, perhaps on account of infancy or some perfectly involuntary circumstance through which they are prevented from receiving it, even if they wish. End quote. So he's speaking of infants and people who wish for or desire baptism yet are prevented not because they put it off through their own fault, but because of some involuntary circumstance. And concerning that category of individuals, he says that they will not be glorified. Therefore, there is absolutely no doubt that in every possible way, he rejects the idea that people who desire baptism, wish for it, can be saved without it. Although St. Thomas Aquinas was an heir about baptism of desire, he would not have condemned those who agreed with Gregory Nazianzen and rejected baptism of desire. However, St. Thomas Aquinas would condemn the modern defenders of baptism of desire for believing that man can be saved in any religion whatsoever.